Welcome everyone to the Greater Eureka Chamber of Commerce State of Economy webinar. I'm Scott Pesch, Cobalt Banker Commercial. I'm also the chair of the Eureka Chamber Board of Directors. The board and the staff would like to thank you for joining us today as we work to support you, your business, and your community. We have brought together four of our leaders from the state, county, and city to provide valuable information that will help you make the best decision for your business moving forward. The next hour is designed to provide you with tools to assess you in navigating the direction, sustainability, and growth of your business as you formulate tactics and strategies to move forward in 2021. After the presentation, our panelists are available to address your questions. Sierra Dillon, Chamber of Commerce Flex Workspace Coordinator will now join us to give you the details on how you may ask questions and participate in today's webinar. Thank you to our sponsors who generous donations have allowed us to provide this event at no charge to our participants. The County of Humboldt, Advanced Security, Bear River Casino and Resort, and Chevron. Go ahead, Sierra, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Sierra Dillon. I'll be managing the Q&A, which will take place at the end when all of our speaker presentations are complete. So take a look at your screen. And if you have any questions, you can see in the bottom right part of your screen where it says Q&A, you're just gonna click right there and you can type in your questions. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. If your question is for a specific speaker, it is important that you please note that in your question. Thank you. And another thing, just please be as specific as possible with those questions. And now I will turn it over to the Eureka Chamber of Commerce President and CEO, Donna Wright. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got a really wonderful participation today. And I'd just like to welcome our speakers. Our first speaker today is Randy Weaver. Uh, Randy Weaver is, the lab, is a labour market consultant. Randy is uh, with the California Development Centre. He's one of 23 labour market consultants statewide. Weaver provides labour market data for five county areas, Del Norte, Humboldt County, Mendocino, Siskiyou, Trinity Counties, and Weaver likes, uh, lives and works in Humboldt County, offering data expertise for assisting rural and small communities with workforce and economic develop, development initiatives and projects. Weaver will discuss the labour market trends for the last three to six months, occupation and skills demands, upcoming opportunities to grow local labour market in areas such as aquaculture, cannabis and green infrastructure. Take it away, Randy. Thanks, Donna, uh, and thanks to the Chamber and the Chamber staff as well for inviting me today and for all their hard work in getting this event set up for us today. Uh, so uh, my presentation today has two parts. First, as Donna said, we're going to look at what happened in 2020 and then some views of current labor market demand. Once we've seen what that current demand looks like, we're going to explore some ideas about possible future areas of employment growth. Uh, so uh, in among all of that, we will try to get an idea of how those developments might impact the economy of the city of Eureka in particular. So uh, let's take a brief look at what happened in Humboldt County and Eureka during the dumpster fire known as 2020. Uh, we're going to start first at the bottom left corner of this graph. Uh, there are three trend lines. Uh, the blue line represents the 2019 monthly unemployment rates when we saw record low unemployment rate for the county. Uh, every month across 2019, it, in September there, you can see we actually went down to 2.9%. The next line is the red line, which shows that same unemployment rate trend across 2020. And then five, you can see that we peaked out at 13.8% in April, uh, where we skyrocketed up from 3.9%. And then finally, I have a third line, the gray line. This is the unemployment rates at the peak of unemployment during our last economic downturn. Uh, so you can kind of get a comparison of what happened this time around compared to the last time. Uh, so you can see right off the bat that what we had was a huge spike. And in fact, the unemployment did rate did exceed the highest rate that we saw during the last 
economic downturn, which is that 11.8% in January of 2011. There's a key difference here, though, I want you to notice. Uh, what we saw was more of an event than a trend. The rates spiked dramatically, but it also fell back down and declined for most of the year. Looking at 2011, you can see that wasn't the case. We had double digit unemployment uh, for a greater part of the year. And even when we trended down underneath it by December, we had gone back to double digits. So how did that affect Eureka in particular? Uh, overall, the county and the city track pretty close together, which hasn't always been the case in past economic downturns. First, we can see Eureka's unemployment rates in 2020 here, but we're basically a mirror image of the trend line we just saw for the 2020 county unemployment rates. Uh, however, uh, at the peak, Eureka's unemployment rate did spike a little higher, about 1% higher at 14.5%. However, as you follow that line down all the way to this past February, we were at 7%. Uh, that was actually slightly lower than the county's rate, which was 7.5% in that time. Now, I can't get... Uh, here's a, a look at total employment trends. And so... I can't get employment by industry at the city level. However, I can get what the total employment for the city is. And this is what it looked like in 2020. We started out at 12,100 and we saw a pretty similar trend to what happened uh, in the rest of the county. That big dip across the summer and a peak up in October and then another decline towards the, the end of the year. However, there was some big differences. Uh, in the county in February, we were still down about 8.9% in total employment comparing February of 2021 with February of 2020. Eureka has done a little better. They were down about 7.4%. So Eureka basically spiked higher, but it's recovered at a slightly faster rate than uh, some of the surrounding areas in the county as a whole. Uh, so this will be the saddest slide in my presentation, and uh, we'll move past this pretty soon on to brighter, happier topics. But this chart compares the industry employment in all of Humboldt County in February 2021 compared to February 2020. In the big picture, total all industries employment was down 8.9%, uh, but that affected some industries more than others. For example, down here, you can see that information and leisure and hospitality took the heaviest impacts. Uh, just for reference, information is actually media like television, magazines, print publications has nothing to do with technology. Uh, what uh, caught my attention most, though, in February was this group right here, where there was just sort of a stagnation. We neither lost employment nor gained employment. So good news that we didn't lose employment there, but that uh, sends a message. Either one of two things is happening here. These businesses are holding tight until they see what's happening with the volatile landscape, or they can't find the staff that they need to fill new positions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the one area in February that saw a really big growth was farm. Uh, this is entirely weird because in the past, farm in Humboldt has been pretty stable and rarely added employment at all, and never in February, <clears throat> and never at that rate. Perhaps some of you have a guess as to why that happened, and in a bit we'll take a look at some evidence that possibly provides a few answers. <clears throat> So now we're going to look at some examples of the current hiring demand. This data comes from Burning Glass, a company that provides us with information on the number of online job ads uh, by geography. Now, it's critical to understand when looking in the numbers in this chart that they do not represent individual positions, but rather only the number of job ads. Uh, it still provides an interesting metric for looking at hire trends. 
The slide that you're viewing now shows the top 10 occupations with the most online job ads in Humboldt County in the last 90 days. In a typical month, this list is overwhelmingly healthcare job ads, but in the last 90 days, the top four entries are retail and food service job ads that in the past months typically didn't even make the top 10 list. So it appears that those businesses are tr making the move towards reopening and trying to staff up. Also at the bottom, you'll notice tutors made an appearance. This occupation has never appeared in the county's job ad data in the six years I've been observing it from month to month. And I think it's a reflection of our impromptu experiment in distance education that has pushed it into the top 10. <clears throat> now the view for Eureka is similar in some ways, but not exactly the same. As for employees in retail and food service, we're also at the top of the list, showing the same trend is happening here to some degree. But as for employees in administration and health popped up too, because those are industries that are already concentrated in Eureka compared to the other county cities. So these charts highlights how the growing reopening is, is changing the structure of the job demand in our area. Uh, this may be a short-term change, uh, but in the unpredictable market right now, only time will tell how this will look in a couple of months. So I anticipated that someone was going to ask this question, and when uh, the questions that were submitted by the chamber members came in, right there it was, why can't I find any employees? And the job ad sort of segues nicely into that. And so here are a few answers. On the chart, you can see the month-to-month -month trend in the size of Humboldt County's total labor force across 2020. See that big valley in the middle starting in April and bottoming out in August? That's the exit of 3,200 workers from the county's total labor force. To put that into some context, the population of the city of Rio Dell is 3,300 people. So that's like in the population of an entire small city in our county just disappeared from the labor force. But then from August to October, 2,400 workers came right back into the labor force when it appeared we were poised to reopen. But many of them rolled right on back out October to November. And here's why. This line down is a line that represents fear. This line here is a line that represents hope. Now, it's kind of funny probably to see in the middle of all this data to talk about the relationship between hope and fear, but it really has a strong effect on people's attitudes towards work. And in fact, this generates a pretty tip, this uh, generates a view of a pretty typical pattern that we've seen in past years, where when there's an economic downturn, some people just exit the, leave, the labor force. They just pack up and leave because they feel like there's no job out there for them. Maybe they downsize their lifestyle. Maybe they move back in with their parents. Maybe they go to work in some aspect of the informal economy. But then later, as the economy heals and starts to grow again, those marginalized workers start to see signs of hope and return to the labor force. And the hope and fear are why the labor force often grows in periods of economic expansion right along with employment. People need hope to return to work, but right now what many of them have is a lot of fear and uncertainty. Vaccine distribution glitches, double mutant variants. If you don't get sick from the virus, the stress from your social media news feed might do you in anyways. So you can even see kind of a miniature version of that here in November, October to November, as it looked like more restrictions were going to be imposed. A whole group of people decided to exit the labor force again. Now that's kind of intangible. Of along the lines of some more intangible reasons why employees are tough to come by. Uh, one that is rising to the top rapidly is the availability of childcare. And that situation has already started to show up on the data. On this chart, you can see the third quarter average employment across five years for child daycare services in Humboldt County. Now, to be clear, this chart only covers employment. I have no way to effectively measure how many independent, non-employer child care providers were affected. Up until 2020, you can see that the industry slowly but steadily added employment in each third quarter. Uh, however, between third quarter 2019 and third quarter 2020, the industry's employment shrank by 113 jobs. This shutdown really impacted this industry because most of the kids were at home now. 
even if the child care centers managed to stay open, then of course they had to operate under many restrictions. So with less staff on the ground, the availability of child care to workers seeking to return to the labor force is likely down as well. And that kind of dovetails really neatly with the distance learning dilemma. Uh, what happens when the parent of these two young students wants to return to work? Do their students already impacted learning collapse into unsupervised chaos? This is a real fear for many parents. Uh, it puts parents in the middle of an ugly decision between their child's education and finding work. So if you have young children who are homeschooling and you have no way to find or pay for childcare, it may indeed limit your ability to return to work and in turn for employers to find employees. So until there's some resolution of some of these factors that we just looked at, I'm, we may just have to do this dance for a little while longer. Okay, so that's the bad news report and we're gonna move on from that because I think we've all seen enough of that over the last year. <clears throat> uh, I presented just so we can acknowledge that there are some challenges, but there's nowhere to go from here but up. So let's shift gears and move on to the topic of where we can expect some growth and progress in the post COVID era. And yes, I said post COVID, I have to have faith that day is on the horizon sometime soon. So we'll start a look with a look at our local aquaculture industry. This is a map of our aquaculture resources that I made from a March 2020 California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on aquaculture across California. According to the report, California has 4,960 available acres of aquaculture water statewide. Out of California's 58 counties, Humboldt County holds 4,045 of those acres or 81% of the state's total acreage. Now, not all of, while all of that acreage is potentially available, right now only about 386 acres are actually in use because not all of it is suitable or appropriate for all types of aquaculture. But nevertheless, this clearly demonstrates that Humboldt County has the largest baseline aquaculture potential in the state. But what does this mean on the ground? Let's take a look uh, in, right now uh, at the employment as it exists, and then let's see what the emerging employment that's coming up will do to our local economy and labor market. Uh, in the third quarter of 2019, I could find around 100 direct aquaculture jobs in Humboldt County. Uh, aquaculture injected about 3 million wages into the local economy with an average wage of about $40,000 a year. The industry also uh, saw $10 million in revenue in the same year. So right now it's not our largest industry, but it's pretty productive for its size. So we've all heard about that Nordic aquaculture is coming to Samoa. Uh, as conceptualized right now, the Nordic operation is estimated to add 150 jobs to the industry. So when it is established, this will instantly over double the aquaculture industry's employment in the county. There's a lot of other exciting developments happening around aquaculture. HSU is running a pilot project for a seaweed farm in Humboldt Bay, for example. Uh, you might ask yourself, well, how much can seaweed be worth? Turns out that it's a $13 billion market worldwide last year, and it's projected to grow to $23 billion by 2027. Uh, this is important because in California, currently, there are no existing seaweed aquaculture operations. There are two planned in Southern California that have not materialized. And so this pilot project could position us at the, the entry point of the state into that seaweed industry. Additionally, there's other activities out there like the aquaponics project where they're raising uh, a closed system that raises fish and uh, plants at the same time. There's the hagfish farm, which expo exports uh, pro their products uh, to the Asian markets. Uh, there's a lot of potential around this that in 10, 15, 20 years, we could be a West Coast hub for aquaculture, somewhat similar to what you see in Washington state with the oyster industry. But the important difference is our industry will be much more diverse, which gives it much better long-term stability, where having a concentration of one kind of aquaculture always leaves you at risk of uh, downturns in that market. 
But the most exciting thing to me about this is the possible industries that we can grow off of this aquaculture. Uh, traditional products that come from fish waste are things like fish meal, fish oil, and fertilizer products. All great products, but overall, they're generally low return products. What I think it may be the future for us is the, what's known as the extraction of biocompounds from fish waste, extracting collagen, enzymes, amino acids, and proteins from that fish waste. Uh, this has been documented in the report that you see cited at the bottom from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services about how this industry is growing. And I think this presents a real opportunity for the ancillary businesses to come in and exploit these. However, we will need uh, trained professionals, you know, lots of scientists, lots of lab technicians to do this sort of work. And so this is where College of the Redwoods and Humboldt State come into the conversation to make sure that we have a good pipeline of trained candidates. And uh, recently I was asked to provide some wage estimates for occupations for Nordic Aquaculture's proposed operation. The company gave me a list of job titles and then I made the best possible match to our occupational wage data for this region. I selected a few examples to show you today that represent a range of training, skill, and wage levels. So one thing I would like to highlight about this on each entry, you will see the title, a wage level, and then an educational requirement and an experience requirement. The wage level is not the proposed wages by the company. Uh, this is the match I made with the job titles they gave me to the regional occupational data because um, it's part of this project was designed to help the company understand what the regional wage market looks like and to offer fair market level competitive wages when they're trying to recruit. So I started with uh, this one, assistant aquaculture technician, and I did that for a specific reason because I found it very interesting. Uh, in the requirements, it, it asked for a basic education, high school diploma, but it very specifically asks for biology and trades experience. So they want someone who knows science and also knows electrical wiring. I think this is really important to our future training needs because this shows how some of the future occupations that may arise in our area will be interdisciplinary and will need training from areas that are traditionally taught as separate disciplines. So I, I thought that one was really important to spend time with. Uh, some of the other occupations were hatchery manager at 87,000 a year, a bachelor's degree and five years experience, bulk receiving technician, good entry level job at 32,809, pretty low education requirement and, and pretty modest experience requirement, a maintenance supervisor at 59,000. And then finally, a laboratory technician at 47,000, an associate's degree in experience preferred. Now, let's have a little fun with some fuzzy math in those numbers. So taking all the occupations provided, uh, I fit calculated an average wage for those occupations. And remember, this isn't the ones, the wages proposed by the company. This is just uh, our estimates currently. The average wage for all of the occupations I was provided with was a, a pretty healthy $59,000 a year. So if we're going to have 150 employees at $59,000 a year, that represents $8.8 .8 million in wages. So I wanted to play around with that a little bit and see what kind of impact it would have. And so I added an economic multiplier to it. If you're not familiar with an economic multiplier, it's a way to gauge the impact of wages in a community, sort of the ripple effect across the economy. In general, especially in some industries like manufacturing, uh, they have high multipliers because the wages generate revenue and further employment in the greater community. Uh, I picked a very modest 1.5 multiplier, basically meaning that for every dollar of wages spent in the community, that turns into a dollar 50 in our economy. Doing that, that bumps that up to $13.2 million. Uh, Humboldt County and especially Eureka's businesses are very well positioned to be the recipients of a lot of that. 
However, I have to stress once again, this is an informational model only. This is a what if scenario. Uh, however, it kind of gives us a view to the kind of impact that the Nordic operation may have here. And since it's rate adjacent to Eureka, I think that Eureka above all stands to benefit from that project. And let's talk really briefly about cannabis, which is another hot topic. Uh, it looks like the cannabis industry has been experiencing a boom in business. Turns out shelter in place orders are good for sales. So as you see from the bar chart, cannabis sales have grown steadily over the years. This chart shows us 2018, 2019, and 2020. On the right, as of third quarter 2020, California had recorded $348 million in sales with the fourth quarter still pending. Uh, and that is already 100 million more dollars in sales than in 2019. This trend is also reflected in the tax revenue. At the top, the purple line represents all cannabis tax revenue combined. In the same third quarter of 2020, the total tax revenue collected by the state was 778 million, projected to possibly exceed $1 billion when the fourth quarter is added to the annual total. So going down the lines, you can see the blue line below there. Uh, that's the state excise tax on cannabis, which was $405 million in that quarter. Why is this important? I don't know I need to spend a lot of time with that, but here's a great example. Uh, this is a map of the counties in California with the most cannabis licenses. Uh, Humboldt County is number two in total cannabis licenses in the state, right behind Los Angeles County. Uh, we kind of knew that already, but I think what's really neat about this map is we're a county of 135,000 souls, but look, here we are, we're playing with the big metro areas in this market. We're right up there with Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, Alameda, all of those areas. And uh, if you look at strictly cultivation permits, Humboldt County is number one in the state by far. Uh, our only real competition, I would say, right now is Santa Barbara. Uh, but, you know, we'll see how that pans out because I think we have an edge because we have the old school knowledge here, unlike Santa Barbara. One question I get a lot is... Uh, what is how many jobs are there in cannabis in here and it's been really tough i've spent years trying to crack this nut and find out what's inside uh so recently using uh the most recent detailed data that i could get to really peek into this i was finally able to locate real solid cannabis numbers that i can directly prove are connected to cannabis firms now, I want you to understand this is me building the plane while I'm flying it. There is no established methodology. There are no flags in the data that tell me someone is a cannabis company. I have to use coding and the fact that I've lived here for a long time and I know who some of these businesses are, uh, which brings up the point that there were a few big players I couldn't find. The data is a little funny. Employers can report in a bunch of ways. Sometimes they report one total number for their company. Sometimes they report by each individual establishment. So there's a few big players in Humboldt County whose headquarters are located outside the county. They did not show up in the data for the county. So you can regard this as kind of a low range estimate. But I was able to find for sure 90 cannabis employer firms. Notice those are employer firms, that is not total firms, those are just companies with employment. That represented 800 direct jobs in cannabis. I also created a sort of a cluster of support firms. Uh, I found about 50 of those. And those were firms like cannabis business associations, nutrient and soil manufacturers, garden and hydroponic stores. Uh, there were about 700 jobs associated with them. When I used the total wages and I calculated a mean average wage uh, for cannabis employment, it was about $44,000 a year. And for the support employment, it was about $37,000 a year. Uh, slightly lower for support because there's a big retail component and there's a fair good concentration of lower wage jobs there. So the next question I get with cannabis is quite often, 
what kind of ads are out there? A lot of businesses want to know, am I competing with the cannabis industry for employees or do my wages match the, the cannabis industry wages? We hear a lot about high pay over there. So let's take a look at three different occupations that were advertised on Indeed.com on March 8th for jobs that were located in Humboldt County. I tried to pick uh, a range, a high skill job, a middle skill job, and an entry skill job. So for the high skill uh, was a controller position for a cannabis company, required a postgraduate degree, 10 years of experience, and paid $90,000 to $160,000 a year. This job could be located in any industry in Humboldt County. Uh, it's pretty much for, except for the fact that it had the word cannabis in the uh, job description. It wasn't very different in its description of its duties than any other controller job. Next, for middle skill, I picked a compliance metric manager. Now, compliance managers are kind of like controllers in the sense that there's a lot of them. They're in high demand as well. Uh, but this kind of bridged that gap a little bit because they specifically wanted you to have metric experience. If you're not familiar with metric, this is the system that the state mandates that cannabis and companies use in order to track all of their cannabis in order to keep legal cannabis from being diverted to the underground market. So you needed to have those compliance skills, but you also needed to understand metric. Uh, they wanted an associate's degree, two years of experience, and it paid $18 to $24 an hour. Finally, for an entry level, uh, we had a cannabis insurance underwriting assistant. That was exactly how the company wrote their title. Uh, pretty modest requirements for education and experience, good entry level, uh, $17.20 an hour. Uh, but once again, this kind of bridges it. It says cannabis specific, but the skills that someone would, would learn as an underwriting assistant would be transferable really to any insurance company. And then finally, I wanted to talk just for a second about uh, our proposed broadband cables and the arrival of high-speed international broadband in Humboldt County. Uh, on the slide, you can see the proposed cable landing site in Samoa, which is an interesting congruence with the aquaculture product that Nordic proposed because it's right across the street. <laughs> uh, Samoa is a busy place these days. When this cable actually lands, uh, it has the potential, in my opinion, to revolutionize the county's economy because of the tremendous potential that it brings with it. But that cable is only the beginning. If you look here, you can see uh, four cable routes. The proposed cable is the second one from the bottom, the one originating in Singapore. That one looks like it's on its way. For I don't want to say for sure, but the signs are good. However, once we land one cable, we have the potential to land many more cables, which would allow us to create a data hub here. This would be beneficial in so many ways to Humboldt State uh, because... For example, what goes good with a uh, international broadband cable? Why a polytechnic university? Because you're going to need all of those trained scientific and technology professionals to fill all of those positions. But some of the other things it could do is bring facilities like this one that you're looking at to our area. This is a Google data farm located along the Columbia River up in Oregon. Uh, these kinds of facilities could be in the future of Humboldt County if these cables actually materialize here. So if all of these elements come together, we get the cables and Humboldt decides to become a polytechnic university, it could really change the future. However, that could bring some additional challenges. For example, uh, housing is on everyone's radar. And if we're going to bring all these folks here, then you know we're really gonna have to plan on how are we gonna house them. And so I, believe that that's all I have for you today. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Sierra. Or Donna. <laughs> or, or Donna. Randy, you know that I always appreciate your statistics and financial expertise, uh, sharing real time uh, graphics with us that we can take away to plan uh, for our futures. Now I'd like to uh, have our next speaker, Scott Adair. 
Scott Adair is the Director of Economic Development for the County of Humboldt. Adair is a former planning commissioner, trainer, business owner, and commercial real estate agent with over 18 years of experience in real estate asset management and public and private economic development. Adair completed his basic economic development certification through BEDC in partnership with Colorado State University. Graduated from Oklahoma University's prestigious Economic Development Institute program, he's a member of the Greater Eureka Chamber of Commerce Leadership Program, and we are happy to introduce you, Scott. Hello. Um, thank you, Donna, and to the entire team for putting this event together. Um, it, momentous effort and wonderful for the community. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, attempt to share my screen here. Uh, I do have a presentation and I just want to check uh, with staff that my presentation is reflecting on the screen. We're good to go. It's up. Yes, you okay. are good, Scott. Okay, great. Um, well, hello everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Adair. I am the Economic Development Director for Humboldt County. Prior to my current role, as Donna indicated, I served as a former Vice President of Economic Development for an Ohio-based real estate investment trust. I am also a former commercial real estate agent. I am a former business owner, a former planning commissioner, and also a former community development block grant CDBG advisor. I also happen to be the official chocolate chip cookie taste tester of the Adair household, which has been in high demand during COVID. And I'm entirely serious. You should see what has happened to my waistline during the pandemic. But let's go ahead and move on to the presentation, shall we? What is the state of the economy? Uh, the title of such an event feels very formal. When I hear state of the economy, it conjures up images of formal pomp and circumstance like this very famous picture here, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. The important question that we need to remember to ask ourselves is not just solely what is the state of the economy, but also how and why. And before we get into the how and the what and the why, and before we delve into metrics and data of this presentation, I want to create some context around our present situation. COVID-19 is certainly recognized as a public health crisis and an economic disaster. But pre-COVID, regional disaster was already upon us. Who can forget the campfire which destroyed the town of Paradise? or the August complex fire of last year. As a result of these fires, the Red Cross housed over 300 climate refugees in Humboldt County alone. In fact, climate and disaster refugees are anticipated to be a part of future migration activity into Humboldt County, especially as individuals seek to escape not just fire prone areas, but also densely populated areas where viruses like COVID can spread quickly. This means that climate refugees may become a very real part of the future state of our own economy. Experts expect some 13 million coastal residents in the United States to be displaced by the end of this century. One pre-COVID study gave indication that up to 250,000 people would be looking to escape the Bay Area by 2050. And that was due to climate change. The COVID effect or the aversion of living in highly populated areas had not even been factored yet at the time of that study. Interestingly enough, some of you know, I represent this metric. I am a climate refugee who fled disaster to come to Humboldt County. This is our house in Shasta, California after the car fire of 2018. I had never heard the term fire NATO before until the car fire, but at 7 p.m. on July 26th, a towering vortex of smoke and flame spun into the California sky, 
rose over 16,000 feet into the air, breached the Sacramento River, and headed towards Shasta and Redding, California, where our home was located. This is me scrounging through the rubble to see if there was anything left remaining of value. The fire was so hot that it warped our cast iron skillet to our stove and fused it. We were unable to separate the two. Incidentally, the melting point of cast iron is roughly one fifth the temperature of the surface of the sun. Now, at this point, you might think, okay, Scott, why are you giving us this sob story? Is this a cheesy attempt to elicit compassion or to get you to feel sorry for you? No, it's not. But my own story does help us to understand the nexus between crises and economic equalizers. My family and I were fortunate to have recovered from our own personal disaster. Humboldt's tale will be similar. Our state of our economy will be a story of moving from disaster to recovery. So how do we do it? How does a community recover from disaster? Well, first off, we've done it before. COVID is not the first disaster from which Humboldt has reemerged a stronger community. Anyone familiar with this? The December 1964 storm? This storm was of unprecedented intensity in the region. The Matol River registered a staggering 50 inches of rain during the period, including 15 inches on December 22nd alone. That's more rain than some areas in the county receive in an entire year. Across the North Coast, 24 people died as a result of this flood, including 19 in Humboldt County. Another 1,200 were injured. The county recorded more than $53 million in damages including $14 million to state highways, $12 million to county roads and buildings, and $23 million in damages to private property. $4 million alone was spent on cleaning up debris as a result of this flood. Here's another pre-COVID disaster with economic consequences. On April 25th, 1992, at 11.06 a.m., a magnitude 7.1 earthquake struck near Petrolia, California, which initiated another series of shocks in the Cape Mendocino area. Two additional so shocks of magnitude 6.6 and 6.7 occurred the next morning. Collectively, these shocks caused significant damage to older structures in our community. And the earthquake caused 98 injuries and economic losses in Humboldt County topped $66 million for this disaster. So then there's today. COVID has caused an economic crisis, which has resulted in financial disaster for many businesses. Like the floods, fires, and earthquakes, we have recovered from disaster before. But how long will it take? And what are the present circumstances impacting our recovery? This leads back to that important question, which I also posed at the beginning of this presentation, which is why. Or let's get a little more specific. Why attend this discussion today? Why even attend a meeting or a conference where the state of the economy is going to be discussed? Why would that be a topic of interest to a business? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but in part, you came here today expecting to be informed. You want information. And it's no surprise that you want information. Most business owners and entrepreneurs who I know are self-starters. They are doers. I am a former business owner myself. I understand the propensity for business owners to want to take action. In fact, in cases like these, many business owners cannot afford to not take action. Businesses want to know what it is that they need to do in order to recover, to help their clients, their customers, and their employees, especially during an economic crisis. And for that, businesses need data. Oh, wrong data, not this data. Yes, this data, numbers, metrics, statistics. In fact, I think some of us would eat data if we could. We're inundated with it, really. Data is everywhere. It's in the news, on social media, in our email inboxes, our Twitter feeds. For some of us, it seems the more information we can get, the better. So speaking of data, let's get into some numbers and share some statistics. We'll start with some good news in this chart shown here. 
yes, it feels like things are really bad right now. And for many businesses, it is. I acknowledge that. But if you thought the COVID crash was bad, then you certainly wouldn't like this. This graph demonstrates what our S&P market value would look like if the Great Depression happened again tomorrow. If a Great Depression scenario were to happen based on the March close of almost 4,000 points, we would not see the bottom of the market for two and a half years. At the bottom, the S&P would hit 539 points, which is a level that that index has not seen since June of 1995. And for everyone who expects a super fast recovery, prepare for the long haul. Because if a Great Depression scenario happened tomorrow, the S&P would not surpass the March numbers again until the year 2046. Okay, so it's not the Great Depression. But we cannot discount the COVID business losses either. During the first 90 days of the pandemic, the county tracked adverse impacts to our business community. In the first 90 days alone, the county recorded over $41 million in revenue loss to the business community and over 2,500 lost jobs. Is there a silver lining to any of this loss? On this, some economists disagree, but strangely enough, Economists and sociologists recognize that disasters like plagues and revolutions, war, collapsed states, etc., actually reliably and historically reduce economic disparity. That is why some economists call catastrophes market corrections or economic equalizers. And we have certainly seen a number of market corrections or equalizing events in our nation since between the Great Depression and COVID-19, and some of those are listed here. So then market corrections and economic equalizers aside, what about recovery from our present disaster from COVID-19? Some analysts, as indicated in this graph, which reflects total sales tax trends for the state, are predicting recovery in the state of California within two years. Other analysts are even predicting significant new growth after that recovery. This is good news. It is far from the recovery period of the Great Depression and quicker than recovery after the Great Recession of 2009. To aid in our recovery, the County of Humboldt gave back a portion of the Emergency CARES Act funding that it received from the federal government and put those dollars back into the community in the form of SBRR or Small Business Restart and Recovery Grants made to Humboldt County businesses. Through that program, over $3.4 million were given to 689 businesses throughout Humboldt County. These SBRR grants were not limited to just unincorporated areas of the county. This chart shows the breakdown of funds distributed by municipality. Businesses in the city of Eureka received over $1.5 million collectively of the total SBRR dollars that were given back to the community. So the information discussed in the previous slides are not the only metrics that we can use to paint a picture of the state of our economy and our economic prosperity. There are many other indexes and indicators which economists monitor in order to gauge the well-being of the economy and which businesses can track as well. Some of those other sources of information already have or will be addressed by other speakers here today. Listed on this slide are just a few indicators which business owners can follow such as gross domestic product, the consumer price index, and housing starts. But wait, there's more. Because if you like oddball data, some economists have taken measuring consumer behavior to the nth degree. The indicators listed on this slide, such as the high heel index and the buttered popcorn index, are actually not a joke. They are real indicators that some experts use to gauge the state of the economy, like the take-home box indicator, for example national trends concerning restaurant patrons who choose or not choose to take leftovers home in a take-home box can actually be a sign of the strength or weakness of the economic prosperity in our community. So with all the data available to us, which metrics do businesses choose to base their decisions or their actions upon? Whether it's mainstream indicator or a wild one like the buttered popcorn index, the choices and options available to businesses can sometimes be daunting. Also, there's an old joke that goes, when you put 10 economists in a room, you get 11 opinions. 
It is important to remember that indexes can only accurately measure the past. Metrics as indicators are signposts for us to aid us in our decision making. They're not solely solutions. They can point us in a direction, but they're not necessarily the vehicle to take us there. In fact, many of the indicators and indexes which we use to assess the economy are measurements over which businesses don't have a lot of control. And that can be frustrating. But don't let that cause you to lose hope. Let me tell you about a measurement of economic success, which businesses can have a direct impact on immediately starting the moment you leave here today. Consumer confidence. You heard Randy talk about fear and hope. It's a real thing. The US Consumer Confidence Index or the CCI is an economic indicator which measures the degree of optimism in the economy and which reflects how consumer mood impacts the activities of consumer savings and consumer spending. As indicated in this graph above, a consumer confidence index score of 100 or more signals a boost in consumer outlook toward the future. It also predicts that consumers are more inclined to spend money on purchases in the next 12 months. Alternatively, a CCI score below 100 indicates a pessimistic attitude toward future developments in the economy, indicating a tendency to save more and consume less. Let's look, look at what happened on this graph to the CCI in the first quarter of 2020. Let's zoom into that period of time. This graph spans fourth quarter of 2019 through first quarter of 2020. After the first shelter in place orders and masking mandates went into effect, the consumer confidence index fell from 118 points to 86.9 points in April. After that, the index continued to fall, reflecting the largest drop on record. So why should businesses care about this? Consumer confidence has a direct impact on consumer spending. According to some experts and the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, consumer spending is widely accepted as one of the single most driving forces of the US economy. Almost two thirds of consumer spending is spent on services, the remaining one third on goods. On the most basic level, a consumer's behavior and spending is widely impacted by mood, hope, fear. Studies show that external factors like the news, like politics, traffic, even sunshine can have a huge impact on a consumer's mind frame and by extension, their spending. Happy or sad, how a consumer feels directly impacts their contribution to our local economy. I recently worked with a team of experts and paid a lot of money to develop an extremely complica complicated graph to demonstrate this. You can tell that this graph is very complicated because it includes different colors and multiple symbols. Okay, joking aside, the simplicity of consumer confidence is also the beauty behind it. When consumers feel better, they spend more. This is widely studied and adopted throughout the economic world. Both anecdotal and empirical evidence exists to prove that the mental state of a person or a population influences prosperity. But what, you might ask, can a business do to affect consumer confidence or enhance consumer optimism or mood? Fortunately for us, the answer is not as complicated as this graph here. Unlike other activity which influences economic indicators, consumer confidence is something that businesses can build into their model and have a direct impact on. Positive customer experiences increases the possibility of increased buying behavior. This goes for employees too, as mood can affect productivity in the workplace. We know this. The McKinsey Institute is an organization whose mission it is to help leaders in the commercial, public, private, and social sectors develop a deeper understanding of the evolution of the global economy. As seen in their chart here, the customer's mood and experience has an impact on how they spend. Businesses can take relatively simple steps to initiate and trigger this behavior, such as creating a welcoming ambiance, crafting an experience around the services that you provide, offering unrivaled customer service, being reliable, ensuring that products and services are of high quality, striving to build and maintain relationships with consumers, and so on. 
in short, good business is good business. Do your research on your consumer and find out what makes them tick. Now, with COVID-19, we have to also point out that health and economics go hand in hand too. Studies have already proven that as the number of COVID-19 cases grow, consumer confidence declines. And when consumers feel unsafe, they are less likely to engage in economic activity. Or when they do, they may overparticipate in online economic activity, which often overshadows or upstages local businesses. Now I'm with you. As a former business owner, I want to see COVID and all of the restrictions on businesses go away. But people feel less financially optimistic and more likely to be cautious when cases are surging. Businesses can play a role in helping consumers feel safe by following public health recommendations. Helping consumers to feel safe and protected also impacts mood and will spur economic growth. Now, some of you may be rolling your eyes. Really, this is what I came here for, to learn that I need to create a positive and optimistic environment in my business. This all seems like fluff. Well, yes, it's what you're hearing because it's true. It works. There's plenty of research to support it. Moreover, it's a fundamental characteristic of human behavior, which has been employed by governments and in public relations and advertising for some time. There's a reason why the World War II slogan was not, we can't do it. The point is, unlike some of the other metrics and data shared in this presentation, there are things which businesses can do to increase consumer confidence and enhance consumer spending, thus increasing the bottom line and improving the state of our economy. Businesses won't have to do it alone. If you've not heard already, I'm excited to share that Humboldt County's award through the American Rescue Plan Act is now official. The bill includes $65.1 billion for communities. Humboldt County's allocation is over $26 million. Counties were not the only recipients of this funding. The city of Eureka, for example, was awarded over 5 million. This funding creates more opportunity for government to provide additional relief to our business community. Staff will be working on a spending plan and a budget for these funds, which will be brought before the County Board of Supervisors for adoption. So now's your time to give input. We want to hear from the community about how these funds should be spent to aid in our recovery. So if you have an idea, please email our team at gohumco at co.humboldt.ca.us. I truly appreciate your time today. As a former business owner, I understand that there are other priorities which you have sacrificed in order to attend this presentation. Thank you for the giving of your time. I've included some links here for some of the metrics which I shared in my report. You can screenshot this slide if you would like, or you can reach out to our office using the contact information I have provided, and we will send it to you. Two more jokes about economists before I go. An economist's left leg is on fire. His right leg is frozen. He says, oh, on average then, I'm fine. And if you laid all economists in the world end to end, they would never reach a conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Happy recovery. Go make it a great day. I will share. Thank you, Scott. I will share that uh, Scott, as a sponsor, uh, was able to have those jokes in there. Um, otherwise, if he hadn't been a sponsor, they would have been cut out. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Uh, just great, valuable, all-rounded information. And now we're going to finish our presentation with both Miles Slattery and Lane Millar. Miles Slattery is the City of Eureka Manager and has been involved in local government for more than two decades. Slattery has implemented and served on teams that created innovative and collaborative service models in the construction of public facilities, economic development, golf course management and social services programming. He previously held positions as Eureka's Community Services Director, Project Manager and Deputy of Public Works. Lane Millar is the City of Eureka's Finance Director. The Finance Department is responsible for providing the financial management of all city funds and maintaining the fiscal integrity of the city. Take it away, Miles. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, before we start, um, Lane is gonna be doing the controls on this, so he'll start screen sharing. 
Um, before we start, on behalf of the mayor and city council and the staff at the city of Eureka, we really want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for, for putting this webinar on and also want to thank them for all of the hard work they do for our businesses. It, it doesn't go unrecognized and, and we really appreciate all the work you guys do. Um, so for our presentation, uh, Lane, do you have that up? So uh, as Donna had said, uh, we're gonna kind of tag team this. Lane's gonna talk um, a little bit about um, state of the local economy, the trends and uh, revenues that the city brings in. And then I'll get the fluffy part of it and talk about the uh, marketing efforts um, going forward and leaving um, this pandemic situation or actually recovering from it. So with that, Lane's gonna start with the state of the local uh, with the uh, trends in the tax revenue. So Lane, take it away. All right, thank you, Miles. Um, in this first section, we will be looking at the 2020 fourth quarter sales tax revenue. And to better understand the performance of our local markets, we will be looking at revenues from across the state and on the North Coast. So starting down in Southern California, so in the fourth quarter of 2020, they saw a decline of about 7% in sales tax revenue. Uh, the Central Coast was down as well, about 2.6%. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley was up by 8.6%. The Sacramento area was down slightly. The Bay Area took a hard hit and was down over 10%. The Sierras were down slightly. And then the far north, which includes Humboldt County, was up by 4.8%. And if we look at the state in total, the state was down overall by a negative 5.5%. There were only two regions in the state that saw positive results. Uh, that includes the San Joaquin Valley and the far north. Next, we'll look at, sorry, uh, uh, revenues on the north coast uh, by county. Again, this is fourth quarter 2020 versus fourth quarter 2019. Uh, down in San Francisco, this was one of the hardest hit places in California in terms of sales tax. Uh, their fourth quarter saw a drop of almost 37%. Uh, in Marin County, uh, they were down as well. They were down about 6%. Uh, Sonoma County, down about 3%. Uh, Napa was hit hard as well. They were down over 16%. And then we get to Lake County. Lake County was up by 7%. Mendocino, up over 7%. Humboldt County, increased by 6.6%. 6, 6 and then Del Norte was up almost 19%. Next, we'll move into Humboldt County and Eureka. So the main players in Humboldt County uh, are the unincorporated areas, Fortuna, Eureka, and Arcata. This orange bar is 2019, this blue bar is 2020. So in the unincorporated areas of the county, they saw growth of about 4.2%. Fortuna was up almost 19%. And Eureka was up by over 7%. We haven't seen this growth since 2016. Uh, Arcata, unfortunately, was down by two and a half percent. Next, we'll look at uh, City of Eureka industry groups. So again, orange is 2019, blue is 2020. Uh, our biggest sales tax generator are general consumer goods. That was up by 9%. The next category, state and county pools, that represents online shopping. Uh, that was up by over 50%, but that is because in 2019, the state made some changes which forced online retailers to submit sales tax returns. Uh, autos were down about 3%, building and construction up six. Uh, restaurants and hotels were down almost 15%, which makes sense. The pandemic and the shutdowns really affect these businesses in a negative way. Uh, Miles will be talking about ways we are going to encourage sales in this category. Uh, food and drugs down 1%, business and industry down 22%, and fuel and service stations were down almost 30%. Next, we will talk about transient occupancy tax for TOT. 
Again, blue is 2020, orange is 2019. So the first quarter of 2020, uh, where the shutdown only affected us, you know, mid March, uh, we saw a decrease of about 15%. That next quarter, that April to June period, uh, was down by over 50%. But in the summertime, we did see a little bump. And then the fourth quarter of 2020, we were up almost 14%. Next, we will move on to Eureka home values. Uh, this data comes from our property tax information. Uh, this is uh, focused on single family residences. On the left, uh, that shows you the median price by quarter. That's represented by the blue bar. On the right, that is number of sales represented by the orange line. First, we're gonna look at sales. So in the second quarter of 2019, we saw a large volume of sales, about 95. And since that time period, sales were on the decline. Uh, in the second quarter of 2020, during the shutdown, we only saw 49 sales. But the most recent quarter uh, of 2020, fourth quarter was up by 96. Uh, you know, we go back to the first quarter of 2019, the median price or the average price of a home in Eureka was 251,000. And in the fourth quarter of 2020, that price increased to over 300,000. So this concludes my section of the presentation. I'm gonna pass it back to Miles. Thank you, Lane. Um, so before I go into the marketing efforts, marketing efforts, I just wanted to talk a little bit on reference to some of the information that Scott Adair was presenting. Um, the city received some CARES funding as well um, during the pandemic. We had our first round. Um, it wasn't anywhere near the level of the county, but you know, council and staff really realized the importance of our businesses, and we took the vast majority of that money, one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars of that, and made available a grant program for our businesses for outdoor retail and, and, and dining spaces, as well as for equipment used for outdoor. On top of that, um, when, the, when the pandemic was just starting and through the pandemic, we did projections on sales tax revenue and they were very bleak. Um, the numbers that Lane is sharing with you was definitely a surprise for us. And we realized some um, excess revenue that was unexpected. And so we went to council and um, took about $330,000 the council approved to do a bridge program for our businesses to help them with rental and mortgage assistance. Um, we have a waiting list now and that it amounts to about another $80,000 or so. And we plan on going to council um, to, to increase that funding for that program so that we can continue to help our local businesses. Um, as far as current marketing efforts, um, the first area I wanna cover, you can go to the next slide, is wayfinding and beautification. Um, in partnership with um, our marketing consultant, Eddie Alexander, as well as some local groups, Project Eureka, Keep Eureka Beautiful, we're, we've been working on um, a lot of projects. Um, the first I'd like to talk about is wayfinding. Um, the first component of the wayfinding is updating the kiosks that you see throughout town. Um, those kiosks will be power washed and cleaned up and the panels replaced with our local branding. And updating these key kiosks serves multiple purposes. It'll um, provide a welcoming reflection for the city and also reinforce the city's brand. Um, it'll help visitors down 101 understand that there's a lot to see and do in our commercial areas. And it'll provide directional assistance for, for visitors and you know people from the region. Next slide, Lane. Um, some of those kiosks along sea and waterfront, we're gonna be um, updating as well. They'll have maps and wayfinding signage on them. Um, the new, uh, Kiosks will include nearby assets as well as a map of the surrounding area. Um, the uniform look will help to spruce up the streets and the corners in our commercial areas. Next slide, Lane. Um, the other kiosk is the one that's at 4th and Q across from Camiso Park, where we recently replaced the um, billboard there. Um, this is going to be updating a welcome to the historic Eureka sign. Um, the sign will echo the new brand and direct visitors down E Street to the uh, access Old Town and see most of the historic Eureka. Next slide, Leg. Um, and then in conjunction with um, Project Eureka, these are up now. Um, we have put up banners in the heavily traveled sections of Eureka. Um, 
we partnered with Project Eureka, of course, and Eddie Alexander and the, put the banners up along 4th and 5th Street. There are 40 old fashioned light poles in this area, 12 of which will have the Eureka, which do have the Eureka Cultural Arts ba District banners. Um, we won't be replacing those, but we'll be adding the banners. So you see here along either side of the highway in this target area, as well as the north end of town near the kiosk and billboard we just looked at for the historic um, Eureka. Banners will alternate colors as you go along the road and are designed to be long lasting and maintain a vibrant color. Next one. And this one's really interesting. I know that a lot of you are probably aware of the project study report we did with Caltrans. It, uh, dealing with the Caltrans process can be frustrating. Um, the plans that came out through that were um, very much long-term. And so we tried to work with uh, our staff and Caltrans and Eddie Alexander on something that can happen in the more immediate future. So um, this is what we're looking at. This is gonna be at the Herrick uh, overpass on the south end of town. It'll be a landscaped um, uh, sign welcoming people into Eureka. Um, we're working on that. We're hoping that it will be up and running as soon as August of this year. We'll still be looking at the other plan as well, but this will be something that we can do more in the immediate future. Next slide, Lane. And then of course, this is, uh, the big one for the city of Eureka, it's been a project that's been in the works for well over 10 years. Um, it's been a rendition of many of the Sequoia Park Zoo's master plan. And we finally, with the, the help of the lodging alliances here locally, especially the Eureka Lodging, lodging Alliance, we were able to leverage that funding for some grant funding and get over $4 million to build the, the Redwood Skywalk. Next slide, Lane. So this highly anticipated project is scheduled to open in the very near future. Um, when it does, one ticket will get you into both the zoo as well as the skywalk. Um, excitement for this new attraction is building not just locally, but all across the country. We're also getting inquiries from media around the country. We're extremely hopeful that this new asset will help reinforce the city's position as the cultural and economic hub for Humboldt County and attract more overnight visitors to our areas. Um, we feel this will definitely put more heads in beds um, we will have some information. What, what we plan on doing is a soft opening for people in the area and then have a more grand opening with some large events to promote this across the nation. Next slide, Lane. Um, the Skywalk will be an asset that is highly promoted in the region and well beyond the region. Um, stay tuned for the launch of the new redwoodskywalk.com website, which will offer up the latest information about where we're at with the Skywalk. Um, just as for logistical purposes, the Skywalk will, it does have a very much so adventurous leg that's not ADA compliant, and has a little bit more sway to it. Um, that section gets all the way up to 100 feet over the um, forest floor of Sequoia Park, crosses the ravine uh, where the duck pond is, but there's also a leg, it's a little over 600 feet that is ADA compliant um, and will get you to the same experience as you can um, with the more adventurous leg. So it's, it's an outstanding project. And I really want to thank the Lodging Alliances, the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation, and all of the Eureka staff who went through the effort of putting this together and also getting the, the you know, all the grant funding for it. So uh, we're looking forward to it. Next one, Lane. And then as far as, you know, you know, going through the recovery, you know, we're really well positioned for this being, and Scott references, you know, we're, we're isolated, we have low population. Um, we're definitely not in the fire zone as other areas. So you have the climate refugees, but as, also as COVID-19 vaccinations continue, we're excited to announce that the city will begin advertising in May of, of this year. Um, as before, we'll be seeking to balance the desire of visitors to visit and the safe ways in which they can do so. We are hopeful that the pent up traveler demand will help stimulate the local economy, economy through the summer and the fall of 2021. And then also because of the pandemic, you know, regional branding is something that was a big part of our, you know, RFP to go out and um, get outside marketing services. And so next slide, Lane. Um, you know, Eureka is mostly for Eurekans and for people of Humboldt County. In addition to advertising outside the area, our partners at Eddie Alexander are helping us with content creation and media relations, including our newly weekly visit, our new weekly video series and local asset and event promotion. We were having uh, the mayor do a PSA every week and we've transitioned those like literally one year after the pandemic started. And we're working on weekly PSAs with local business owners, um, 
staff at the city of Eureka, as well as um, artists and volunteers to promote the city of Eureka and what they've done to recover out after the pandemic. Um, if you're already doing it, please, if you're already doing that's great. If you're not, please follow Visit Eureka on Facebook and Instagram and at visiteureka.com to enjoy all of the new content that Eddie Alexander is producing and for free frequent reminders of all there is to see and do here in our hometown of Eureka. As a part of strategic visioning, um, council really recognize um, some of the concerns that our, our business industry has and um, are really looking at bolstering our maintenance in the commercial areas. They have approved this upcoming budget uh, to bring back the new, the old um, park maintenance worker that will be solely for the old town area and our commercial areas and also picked up another parks worker as well as two facility maintenance workers that will um, help to, you know, clean and maintain our commercial areas and make them more inviting and going along with the wayfinding and everything. We really think it's going to make a big difference for our, our businesses. So. Um, once again, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm very easily to be very easily found. So if you need any information, feel free to contact me. And uh, once again, thank you to the chamber for having both Lane and I here today. Thank you, Miles and Lane. We appreciate that. And we've seen some questions come through as well as the ones that have been presented to us uh, before our webinar. So I'll hand over now to Sierra. Okay, we are going to start our Q&A. This first question is actually going to be a two-part question because the people that asked them, they were uh, very similar. So whoever wants to answer this one, um, you can go for it. It's not directed at anyone specifically. It says, we're noticing that Humboldt County is at record lows for housing sales, and we understand there is a housing shortage. What actions are being taken at the city and county level? And it also adds in there, what is the timeline or building of housing that was recently to go up in place of the three city owned parking lots? So I can repeat those. Um, I think I can answer that. Okay. At least, at least the city's portion. Um, I'll start with the second question first. Uh, the timing of the three parking lots, um, those were awarded to Link Housing. Um, there's parking lots that are gonna be developed at Sunny and Myrtle, 6th and M, as well as 8th and G. Um, the total number of units will be 107. Um, they'll be lo very low to low income housing. Um, they exceeded what our expectations were for those properties there. So that'll help us with our housing element. Um, so those, as far as timing, should be in construction by 2023 and we should be housing people by 2024 there. We're also putting out another RFP for three other lots. You'll see some public outreach for that for people in the vicinity to talk about that, but those three parking lots will be going out to another RFP in June of this year. And as far as other housing, we really recognize that I'm on a weekly group of uh, people that are interested in housing. It's not just about low and very low income. We received some uh, LEAP funding in order to do a waterfront specific um, uh, study for housing, and that'll obviously be in the you know more mid-range. We've been also talking with HSU and CR, and they want to bring in um, Open Door Health Clinic in St. Joe's to talk about um, some workforce housing and, and some property that the city owns in Old Town. Um, so yeah, we definitely recognize with the broadband, with the refugees, all of those things, it's, it's about all areas of housing and not just low income housing. And we do are also updating our local coastal program so that we can build higher and anything on the second floor up allows for residential. And so because of our space constraints and being built out, we're really trying to make sure that the zoning allows for um, taller buildings so that we can accommodate um, more residential units. All right, thank you so much, Miles. Uh, are there any other speakers that would like to add to that on the housing shortage and any initiatives that are being taken? Sierra, if I could just give a quick comment. Uh, I did have a meeting yesterday in a different subject with the city manager, Blue Lake, and they started an initiative as well for some housing using, units to be uh, increased there as well. So just a little tidbit, just for your knowledge. Thanks so much, Scott. That was very helpful. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second question. 
This one says, our community has seen a significant increase in job openings with vacant positions that aren't being filled. Does anyone have a potential reason for this? Any takers? I'm gonna, go with, I'm, gonna go with hope and, I'm gonna go with hope and fear and let Randy take over. <laughs> yeah, I kind of set myself up for that one. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, I wasn't sure for the mute. Yeah, I, I like I said, I mean, I think we've been through some pretty ugly cycles of hope and fear that are usually elongated over the space of years. We had it compressed into like six months. And so you could get whiplash from looking at, at how that played out. Um, I think that Childcare absolutely has to be a priority. Uh, that's if we want to get our workers back to work, we absolutely need that. And I think also connecting up with uh, College of the Redwoods and HSU uh, to make sure that their graduates remain in our community. Uh, traditionally, especially with HSU, I think our retention of those graduates is relatively low. And that's something I think that has to be turned around if we want to make sure that we're staffed out because Right now, there's a lot of demand across the board, but typically the demand is really acute with the high skilled folks, you know, uh, the, the hardest to retain and also the hardest to recruit people. Um, I think until the vaccine distribution really rolls out and schools open up, it just may be a tough road, unfortunately, for employers uh, because of the fear factor, because of that factor. It can even be things as basic as transportation. I was thinking the other day, how many people had to give up or lost a car in the last year and are now trying to figure out a whole new mode of transportation? And this could be especially acute on workers who live outside the population centers and had had were formally commuting in so there's a lot of moving parts right now um i'm thinking though that as the distribution of vaccine proceeds that we could potentially face a tidal wave somewhere in the future too where you know you saw how people came in and came out uh, there could be a point when all these folks come flooding back into the market and that could be this year if if we really reach keep reaching the the vaccination benchmarks and moving forward Okay, thank you so much, Randy. Anyone else? Okay, we're gonna, oh, okay, go Scott. Just curious yeah. what some of my fellow panelists <clears throat> might think about the childcare issue. I, I know that childcare is still very challenging right now. Um, and I wonder if there are persons or individuals who can't uh, fulfill those full-time employment opportunities because they still have children at home uh, or are unable to find uh, childcare options? So at the city of Eureka, this is a big issue. I mean, we, we started a little over a year ago and opened up a, a, a pre-K daycare for, um, I shouldn't, I'm not supposed to say daycare. Sorry, Susan. But we opened up a pre-K to um, assist our, our employees um, at a very reduced rate. We're, we're planning on expanding that as well, but we're also working with Eureka City Schools this summer on um, them extending because of some of the loss um, curriculum that they had over the pandemic for them to extend their summer school and for us to provide after school programs throughout the summer as well. Um, that's not going to hit the pre-K area, but it'll hit all the other areas. And so we're looking at having the after school and the summer school um, for sessions throughout summer as well. So it's definitely a big topic for our elected officials and for our staff to um, make sure that we provide places for kids to go. Thank you, Miles. That was a, that's a wonderful benefit to the city of Eureka employees. So thank you for sharing that. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, Randy, I know that you touched on this in your presentation, however, maybe just um, go back over it uh, again. Uh, what is the general impact, negative or positive, of the cannabis industry on our local economy? Kind of a broad question, but if you want to hone in on something specific. Sure, uh, sure, uh, I'll try to field that. <laughs> uh, 
overall, I think the impact is overwhelmingly positive in, in an economic sense. Uh, where the challenge lies is once again, that they are seeking the same people that every other business are. And so this only increases the need for those skilled, high quality workers that everyone else is seeking. And as the industry grows and more companies either start or emerge from the underground, uh, it's just going to continue to, to raise the level of pressure on the labor market and the, the demand for those candidates. And so that's why I was mentioning earlier, it's really critical now to start partnering with College of the Redwoods and HSU to help us to figure that out. And also to kind of look at our recruitment efforts and, and you know, what we can do there. Um, in terms of finding employees and the pressure that cannabis is putting on the labor market. Um, I know it's a busy time for businesses, but I would encourage all business owners to stop and take a minute at your, take a look at your recruitment practices. Uh, are they effective? Are they serving you well? Uh, I won't name any names, but I saw some interesting thing the other day, right? Walking around my neighborhood, I saw a little something tacked up on the telephone pole. I thought it was probably a yard sale. I went up, it was actually a local company. Uh, it was a job ad, you know, that they were put up on a telephone pole, pretty old school way to go about it. And this was not a new company. This is, uh, this is a well-established, well-known company. And uh, I was a little taken back by that. It's 2021. And I don't know if like, you know, ads on telephone poles are necessarily the best use of resources in order to recruit employees. So I, I would definitely challenge all the business owners to, to take a look at that. Is what you're doing really effective? And are you really reaching target groups like the millennials, you know, who are making up larger part of our workforce all the time uh, in the ways that they receive that information? Okay, I'm going to take it down, Randy. I know but that we've got two jobs open. I thought that was an effective way, but thank you for clarifying. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no. Hey, you know, I'm not saying they won't get anybody, but it took time. Somebody had to print the flyers out. Somebody had to walk around and put them on the poll. Uh, you know, money is time. Time is money. And I think there's just, you know, more effective ways to go about recruitment. So I have some pretty accurate numbers for cannabis and, uh, and I have to agree with Randy. It's been overwhelmingly positive um, since the end of 2016, when we started um, with ca legal cannabis, we have over a million dollars in license fee revenue for the city of Eureka. We have over 40 operating businesses in the city of Eureka. As of June of 2019, we had over 206, we had 216 full-time employees and 86 part-time employees. And that was, you know, almost two years ago. Um, the biggest bonus, and um, may, many people may not believe, uh, have thought of this when it was going on, but over $25 million in building improvements have happened since then to a lot of our buildings, which were you know, not in good condition. So it's been extremely successful. And then another thing that people didn't expect, we've had multiple incidents that have been resolved because of the security systems that have been installed by these businesses. So. Um, it's definitely had a positive impact on the city of Eureka. Well, that's good news. Thank you, Miles. Uh, I'm just going to hand it over to our president and CEO, Donna Wright. Uh, she's going to do a little wrap up. However, we do have some more um, questions. So she's going to um, take it over from here. I'd just like to thank our panelists for agreeing to stay on. We have had quite a number of questions here and uh, Thank you for just adding a few more minutes to this for those of you that would like to stay on. But just for the sake of time and respect of our agenda, I'd just like to thank our speakers, Randy, Scott, Miles and um, Lane. Uh, I think that your presentations were exactly what our community needed to hear at this time. Thank you, Scott, for adding a little humour into there to what could be perceived as a very dry conversation. I'm a numbers and statistics nerd, and uh, this is why I wanted to bring this forward uh, for our business owners. We at the Chamber uh, want to give our members and our larger community the tools that they need to be able to move forward, not only to, uh, to evolve out of uh, the 
uh, crisis that we've just come through, but to uh, thrive and strive through this. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors today. Uh, first of all, to Scott and the County of Humboldt. Uh, they have been just tremendous in enabling us to put this across in a webinar. To our uh, diamond level uh, sponsors, Advanced Security, Bear River Casino and Resort and Chevron. Without your continued support, we wouldn't be able to do the elevated uh, support that we have given our businesses in the last few years. So I'd just like to thank everybody else and thank the panelists for staying on and uh, the participants for the next uh, few minutes and we can answer some of those other questions. Okay, back to the questions. Hope you guys are ready. So the next one. Uh, is there any evidence or reason for Arcata's sales being much lower than other nearby cities? I would Thought venture to guess is because they're doing remote um, remote attendance at school. I'm sure that has a lot to do with it, but Scott I'm sure knows more. Uh, I, th I think you're right, Miles. Part of that uh, is that the flow of transportation and travel, even within our own county uh, and our own municipalities has changed. Individuals who perhaps were driving into Eureka and working out of their offices here, um, going out into the community, buying lunch, uh, you know, during their work breaks, may be working from home now um, and are working from their home offices. So I think that the daytime population of the city probably has really decreased uh, because of COVID and because of the teleworking issue. Uh, and then I, I think that um, also, I think individuals are just spending less money or they're spending it right down the street versus going out into town and shopping or they're spending it online. Except I don't think that applies to KFC and In-N-Out Burger because their lines are still crazy. <laughs> well, I'm headed there tonight, Scott, so I'll <laughs> check up on that for you. Uh, I did want to throw one thing in. I just uh, looked up HSU's total enrollment. Uh, they have 8,116 students. And so I can imagine that a lot of those folks didn't come to Arcata this year. And so that that had a lot to do with the decrease. Great reasoning. Thank you guys very much. Okay, next question. This is around uh, Humboldt County's competitive wages. This person asks, I'm wondering if Humboldt County offers competitive wages for knowledgeable workers compared to other large remote companies that are very attractive. So what are our, our Humboldt County's wages competitive in the marketplace when there are so many um, online uh, remote jobs you can do? I, I think Randy is our wage expert here. Uh, I, if, if we talk about Humboldt County as an organization, I can tell you that the county has been going through a compensation and classification study over the last two years to really critically look at the wages that it pays to its uh, employees. Uh, but I would turn it over to Randy to, to talk more globally about private public sector wages and what's happening in, in Humboldt. Sure, uh, I can make a few comments there. And this is where I always get in trouble, but here it goes anyways. Uh, Two years ago, I took all the wage data for the North State, our region, compared it to the other regions of the state. And uh, in many cases, our wages came out lower than most of the other regions, not in all areas, not in all jobs, but it clearly signaled to me that there was a, an issue there. Now, you have to put that fact in the larger context of some other things. Uh, for example, in the past, typically wages were one of the biggest costs for employers. That's been sort of flipped around and non wage compensation for employees has grown dramatically over the last decades and has actually surpassed uh, wages as the chief cost for many businesses. So I'm talking about mandated costs like paying your unemployment insurance, 
uh, taxes, paying your uh, state compensation, uh, health care costs, all this have accelerated. And so while I, what I find with the, in the business community is many business owners tell me they would love to raise their wages and they're well aware that there's an issue, but it's really just a simple matter of economics. Uh, if they take money away to raise wages, they have to find that money somewhere else within their business. So it, it's really complicated, but uh, overall there, there is an issue affecting our recruitment and retention regarding our wage levels. Thank you, Randy. Okay, unfortunately, I think this might be another one for you, Randy. Yeah, um, I kind of figured. I know which one it is, too, but go ahead. <laughs> um, is there any evidence that unemployment insurance benefits are having an impact on people returning to work or not returning to work? Sure. Uh, this is a real hot question. Um, now, you know, full disclosure, I work for the state agency that administers that program, so I may not have a completely unbiased opinion here. Uh, I used to work directly with unemployment claimants for years in my job before I became a labor market consultant. I can tell you for a fact that there are indeed people out there who abuse the system. Uh, they are in the vast, tiny minority. Most people who are collecting unemployment insurance benefits are eager to go back to work. If you've ever collected unemployment, it is in fact a somewhat uncomfortable system. You don't just get a check. There are many hoops you have to jump through, many activities you have to complete, such as job searches, and those have to be reported for you to maintain benefits. The program was never designed to be an income replacement, but rather a bridge to help people get across to their next job. Uh, that said, I think that the $600 payments were in some way a necessary evil. I mean, the easiest way I can put it is if you think the lines at the food bank were long now, uh, imagine what they would have looked like without those additional payments. Uh, the second thing I'd like to point out, which I think is completely missed in this conversation, is the pass-through effect that those payments have for businesses. Between May and July of last year, the state issued $31 billion dollars in those $600 payments. And I challenge anyone to tell me that our economy would have been better off if we pulled $31 billion out of it. Uh, if you own a business in Humboldt County, there is a very good chance that some of that money is landing in your revenue stream. So uh, I think it's important to see sort of the big picture here that it is a worker benefit, but it keeps the doors open for businesses. It keeps people who are employed in their jobs now instead of you know joining the ranks of unemployment claimants does anyone else want to add anything that was our last question if any other questions come in uh, we can email them to you and maybe we can help get them back to the people asking the questions but if anybody else wants to add anything here's your chance all right then i will turn it back over to donna thanks everyone I just want to thank you all again. Uh, I also want to make a special thanks to our businesses, our business community and their employees. You have not only survived, but thrived through this uh, crisis. We thank you for leaning on us and our leaders here and all of the other organizations that we've all pulled our resources uh, to be stronger, to keep the uniqueness of our community. I'd like to uh, thank our speakers today. We appreciate all that you do. And uh, we wanna continue here at the Chamber for being a catalyst for business growth, a convener of leaders as we've done today and a champion for our community. We ask you to engage with us, read our uh, newsletters, uh, check out our websites, go to our social media platforms, uh, look forward to our upcoming vodcasts, which we'll be uh, doing bi-weekly to bring uh, good information to you uh, from our local businesses, as well as uh, timely events that you want answers to. Uh, contact us uh, for any speakers that you would like to hear from, or if you'd like to be a speaker, contact us here at the Chamber. Thank you for your continued support. Without that, we would not be able to do the things that we do. We ask you to go forward and prosper. Thank you for attending and joining us today.